Hello. I am, uh, I don't know if I'm looking forward to being here. <laughs> I am looking forward to being here. I love, I love that Jesus calls us and he calls us by name. I love all of that. Um, sometimes we don't necessarily like all the things um, that happen, but I'm, I am very, very excited about the fact that he's, he's, he's working in us. I'm trying to find a place where I can just post something here very quickly. Um, and I, I want to, uh, I don't know how to do that. So if, if somebody could post what I have typed in the title, so I can just look at it just for a second, I don't care who you are. Uh, you will be recorded um, as having done it, but I, I don't know how to do it on here. Ah, maybe here. Here we go. There we go. Now I've got it. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you uh, today basically about uh, prophetic restoration and when the truth is undermined, do we still believe? Um the thing that I'm noticing a whole lot of, and I'm just going to go through this very quickly um, because I think it's very important to what's coming. Please share this. This uh, is a very specific word today. This is actually it comes with with some correction, um, some things that the Lord has um, done with me. The, the reality is um, I value the prophetic. I have been involved in the prophetic for most of my adult life. Uh, since my 20s, um, there probably were some things that actually happened prior to my 20s that I just didn't understand were prophetic. Um, there are things where God reveals things. There's no way that a, a man could know. And I'm not talking about just words of knowledge. I'm talking about things that are happening um, within a person, within a congregation, within a region, within a nation, within the world. And so I've shared those things through the years um, out of faithfulness to God. Um, I'm not looking for a name in regards to that. And that's very important that people understand that. I, I could give a rip uh, about, uh, about that. And there have been times that I've said some things that have not been actually exactly ad adequate and, and correct. There's some things that uh, I've had to go back and I have publicly, publicly, said, uh, listen, um, I missed it on this point, and I just want you to please forgive me for that, and we go on. So those are very, very real things that are happening. But when it comes to uh, the prophetic, God is wanting his church back. It's, uh, it's a very important thing. The validity of true prophecy in the world we now live in, regardless of what has been abused, and it has been, and, and you know that, uh, that the, there have been so many things that have been abused and used in a wrong way. And so as a result, people just reject. They've been just rejecting the prophets and they've been rejecting the prophetic unction of the Lord. Uh, are things that were done wrong? Yes. Were there people that were immoral? Yes. Um, does that mean that the prophetic is wrong? No. And some people are falling into that. Um, it is actually... Uh, something that I'm going to give a direct word to two particular places right now that in, in many regards are using the prophetic in a way that is not helpful. Um, regardless of the fact that things have been abused, uh, they've been used to control, manipulate, and promote personal gain. You know, when people give a word and they have the, they are gaining from it, uh, yeah, I, I've never prophesied to anybody and said, you need to come here, you need to be here. That is prophetic vulgarity. Uh, there are things that we speak into people's lives because uh, we want them to become more like Jesus and not we, but the Lord is speaking things into their life as a result of that. When you have other things and when you have people manipulating, uh, where people are Googling and looking up um, things about individuals and prophesying to them, that is wicked evilness. It is not from the Lord. Um, when you have people that are concocting and conjecturing uh, about certain things, um, that's wrong. Uh, 
uh, when people are reading people and speaking things like that. That is actually uh, not from the Lord. That is that is from demonic realms. And so those are all areas that are very important that we understand that that there are wicked and evil things regarding the prophetic that we cannot become a part of or party to. But nevertheless, the prophetic, I believe, is about to go through a profound restoration. I believe there's going to be a revival in the in the prophetic, but not in just the prophetic, you know? Um, I, I honestly have to just be real with you. Um, some of the things that people have been taught, and, and all of a sudden they're pronouncing themselves prophetic, um, they're encouraging people. Can we just use that term, encouraging? Because it says you can encourage each other while it's still day. But it doesn't mean you're a prophet. It doesn't mean that you're functioning prophetically. Um, there are individuals I know who've had uh, uh, divine encounters with the Lord. Um, I have had some encounters with the Lord. I'm not, not going to run from that. I, why would I lie? Um, why, particularly in, in, in the environment today, I've had, um, multiple encounters with the Lord. I have had multiple encounters with angels uh, through the years. Um, is my focus on angels? No. Is my focus on the Lord? Always. Um, does that mean that, um, those, those encounters with the Lord have greater value than him speaking through, through his word? Absolutely not. Um, actually his word is, is what would it confirm, um, and, and, edify what is what the Lord would actually be speaking. So all those things, when people begin um, stepping out into madness, craziness, and and then when people call themselves prophetic and they're just giving words of encouragement, come on, guys. God is a supernatural God. And if we if we eliminate the supernatural God from, from our walk with Jesus, ah, something's wrong. And in fact, uh, I'm going to speak and I'm going to read this. I'm going to be speaking to you. I'm going to share something uh, with you from Zechariah chapter 5 because the Lord hit me with it. It was like a ton of bricks when it hit me. And I went, oh my gosh, this is what exactly what is going on. So if you have your Bible, you can go there uh, because you're going to want to you're going to want to read this with me and just see what it says. But basically, God wants his church back. Ezekiel 34. You can read that as well. But I want to give a warning up close, personal. This particular feed does speak to situations to both IHOP and dwelling place Anaheim both of whom are in the midst of some very manipulative circumstances uh, brought on by themselves. It was never my intent to speak this dramatically regarding these two issues, but I became responsible to speak to it when I recognized very clearly this was a word to both of them and to the church at large, which is discounting prophetic ministry because of the failure of some. some. This too, incidentally, discounting prophetic is a direct disobedience to the Lord who says we, uh, that we are not to despise prophetic utterance. More than ever, prophetic utterance is needed for the days ahead to keep our hearts, minds, and actions focused on things above, not on things in the earth. So that's kind of, that's kind of the foundation where I want to start with. There are two situations that have happened. Um, probably the, the, the most, uh, the, the vast, the greater, the greatest one has come as a result of what has happened, um, with, um, IHOP, International House of Prayer in Kansas City. And the exposure that occurred with Mike Bickle and with several of the leaders. And, um, I have some precious friends who, um, uh, who, who gave so much, um, of their lives. And, and still to this day, uh, there are confusing things that they've had to deal with. Why? Um, uh, because the heart was that the hearts of these young people would be passionate after God. Is God removing that? No. God still wants the young people to be passionate for Him, to seek His face, to, to go after Him. That, that 24-7 is intending, intended to be the way we're supposed to live, um, with, with the Lord. Your dreams are to be uh, given by the Lord. Your visions are to be given by the Lord. Your ability to articulate what the vision and purpose of your life is, is from the Lord. And so there have been many that have been troubled because some failed. Is this the first failure in, in the body of Christ? No. There has been failure through every generation. Every generation has experienced failure, uh, loss, all kinds of things. People have lied. I remember a number of years ago when there was a comedian, incredible comedian, great, very funny. I laughed at a lot of his things, bought all his albums. His name was Mike Warnke. And Mike, and, and people found out Mike was lying. That the things that he was sharing, he concocted. He'd made it up. It was a great story, but it wasn't true. 
And so as a result, you know, we look at those things, and why am I using those names? Because the Apostle Paul used those things. The Apostle Paul would say, be careful here, be careful here, be careful here. Why? Because, and in one case with Demetrius, says, this guy wants to be first. He wants to be the head of it. He wants to be the spokesman for everything. The reality is, is that what God wants from his people are people to serve him. Jesus is the head of the church, and he's not looking for a replacement. There, he's never abdicated his throne. Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit's the administrator of it. The Father is the Father of all, and he loves us, and he's wooing us to himself through Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. And yes, I believe you must be saved only through Jesus. I don't think, I don't, I, I, I'm not a greasy grace guy. I don't believe that all of a sudden all his grace just covers you whether or not you've repented or not. Um, and whether you've come to the Lord or not. I do not believe that. I believe that it is foul, um, uh, Christianity where people are not walking with God. Um, and, and they think that it's okay. They're okay. And they're just telling people, oh yeah, you're saved already. What a hideous thing. You know, it's better for you that a millstone hung around your neck than you mislead people like this. It's horrible. And it's not biblical. There is nothing, nothing biblical. Some of you will uh, renounce that and say that's not true. It is. No, it's not. And the reality is, is that I believe in a grace that frees me, that heals me, that, that sets me on a different path. But let me go back to where I was. Um, so the, the the greatest impact has probably been in the realm of the prayer movement, the uh, the house of prayer movement, and and what has happened there. And so as a result, and it's affected it's affected all of our lives. Some of us have children that are a part of the prayer movement, whether it be in Kansas City or somewhere else. The the reality is is that God is calling people to pray continually. I don't think he's only called them to pray. I think he's called them also to reach. I think that God has called people. I think that if you're an intercessor, quote unquote, which incidentally is, is in the New Testament, it's pretty hard to find who the intercessors are. I, I understand that you're watchmen on the wall, but the reality is, is that those to me who are the watchmen on the wall, those who are, if you're called to intercede and we are all called to intercede, then to me, you actually become those who will speak clearly and articulately about the Lord and what the Lord wants. And so you, if you've been with, if you've been with the Lord Jesus, you should be able to talk about him everywhere. You should be greater evangelists than anybody. Why? Because you've been with the Lord. And when you've been with the Lord, eh, it's, it, it's that whole, that whole thing where, um, where uh, Peter's brother comes to him and he goes, yo, Pete, I found somebody. Come on, follow me. And that's exactly what happened in scripture. We should be those who say, come and see. Come and see a meeting? No. Come and see a great worship team? No. Come and see the Lord. Come see the Lord move in great power and great authority. So, I want to get specific here, a little bit more specific. There were moral failings that occurred. I, I don't care where you put those things, but there were moral failings. There were moral failings that occurred over what uh, what was known, and ev evidently it's not even there anymore. They've, they've, they've dropped, it's changed, and but over what was IHOP. Uh, why? Because the person who was promoting it um, had a moral failure and then would not share specifically what would subsequently come out and break the hearts of many, and many began um, confirming it con and conferring with each other, and there became this massive mess that went all over Facebook, went all over uh, Twitter or X, uh, went on Instagram, and it just became a nightmare for for so many. And, and all these stories began emerging to where now we're looking at about 10 months, um, maybe even more than that, of, of, of so many, so many things spoken about this issue. It's like, do we have nothing good to talk about? And I believe it is a, it's become a huge distraction, but I also believe it's, it's produced in many just the, the assumption that everything that was said was false. Well, that's not true. There are some of the things that actually did occur. 
there were some prophetic words that were given uh, from people I knew, I loved, who I, I still to this day concur because of prophetic things they spoke, not only to my life that all occurred, but also because they were releasing something from the Lord. Was everything they said correct? Probably not. They're human beings. Uh, it, it, it's funny how we as Christians, we uh, and particularly Protestant Christians, we get so upset that um, that Catholics would say the the Pope <laughs> is without error. Um, no, the Pope's not without error. He has a lot of error. Um, but yet, when it comes to believers, we we. We change it to Christian to Christians, Protestant Christians, and particularly regarding the prophetic, we go, well, they weren't one hundred percent accurate. Well, they're human. We are all human. Peter wasn't one hundred percent accurate. Paul had to rebuke Peter. You might recall that uh, there were things that happened in, in Peter's life where he had to actually be rebuked by the Lord Jesus. Uh, the truth is, is that. None of us has made it. Paul himself said that. He said, listen, I have not yet attained. I'm not there. I haven't reached perfection. And, and so as a result, what happens is we have this crazy, um, this crazy thing where people say they're wrong. They're wrong. They're wrong. Okay. I admit there were some things that were not, not accurate, but guess what? There were a lot of things that were accurate. So what do we have to do? Ah. You have to judge prophetic words. In fact, some, some people who are doing these encouraging words, you need to be judged. In fact, every prophet needs to be judged. It's in scripture. It says that when a prophet prophesies, let the rest judge. If you're not willing to be judged, uh, number one, you're obviously not a prophet. Number two, you're not ready to prophesy at all because correction is a huge part of the prophetic ministry. So if you don't like to be corrected, Stop speaking. And I mean that. Doesn't mean you have a prophetic word because you, you got some kind of a, a, a weird understanding or you had a dream or something like that. Man, the word is filled with stuff where it says what? Oh, you had a dream. Oh, we'll tell your dream. But let those who speak his word speak his word. The truth is, is that God wants to say a lot more and a lot more articulate and a lot more uh, ability to receive what, what is happening. And so that's one place. And so as a result, the prophetic has been demeaned. It's been come against. People don't like it. Secondly, there's another place. It was Anaheim Vineyard, but it was taken over by somebody who worked it for several years, who got by the name of Alan Scott, and he worked it to where it would become similar in many regards to what would happen at Jesus culture or Bethel, at least in uh, communication, doesn't mean it did. Hundreds, hundreds have left. But in the process, they shifted the entire board. They changed, they pushed out everybody who was a part of the original vision that the Lord had given to John Wimber and many others, and that they were finally beginning to see, if you can imagine this, the fulfillment of the promises the Lord made to the vineyard way back in the 70s and 80s. And they were beginning to, they were at a place where that would happen, and this person took it over. Changed the name. Changed it to Dwelling Place Anaheim. Subsequently, there's now another church by his brother um, in Glasgow that was the Vineyard Glasgow, and now it is the Dwelling Place Glasgow. They're trying to start another movement, I guess. But through the whole process, the Lord kept talking to me over and over. I didn't want to address that at all, but the Lord kept talking to me about Ahab and how Ahab wanted Naboth's vineyard. And as a result, he was encouraged. I don't know who's encouraging. But in that story, 
it was not a good person who was encouraging Ahab to go take it. The result was is that Naboth would be killed and Ahab would take over Naboth's vineyard and God would judge Ahab as a result of that. He also judged Jezebel as a result of that. These were stealers. These were the people who were coming and they were taking over what was never promised to them. Never promised to them. It was promised to a previous, to a previous, a different group. Let me tell you something. That's the most dangerous place to be. The last thing you want to do is lay hands on what God has promised to somebody else. You are in serious danger. I'm giving that as a word prophetically. Am I, am I allowed to say that? I, I don't want to say that. But the Lord gave me a passage this week. I love Zechariah. I've preached many times from Zechariah, but I'd never seen this quite like this. And, you know, sometimes the Lord just takes his word and he says, I want to give you a, a, a different slant on it. Now, I realize some of you, uh, your, your apologists, your, your hermeneutics are perfect. You're going to go, ah, you're quoting for the Old Testament. You're, you're, you're miss. I'm just going to tell you what I heard as I read this. I looked at it. Again, and there before me was a flying scroll. Now, let me explain something to you about the scroll. About two and a half, three years ago, almost three years ago now, an angel showed up in my room. Yep, an angel. And he was, he had a scroll. And he was handing me the scroll. And because of some situations I've been in in the past that have been very difficult, very hard situations, I was like, I don't, I don't want it. And he said, you got to take it. I said, I don't want the scroll. I don't want the scroll. And he said, you have to take it. I said, I don't want it. I said, I don't know what's in it. I don't know what's in that scroll. I don't. And he says, you got to eat it. And I said, I don't want it. And he said, you promised me the Lord was speaking. Anytime, anywhere, anything. Danny, take the scroll. And I took that and I would go through one of the most intense battles over the next three years that I've ever experienced physically. I was immobile. I could walk seven steps. I would be in pain if I stood for more than a few minutes. There was, it was a horrific thing. I gained all kinds of weight. It was horrible. I've lost, um, 160 pounds since that period of time. But the reality was my life, my own wife wondered if I would live. During that time, it was that painful and that horrific. And it came right after I was offered a scroll. I understand the scroll. The scroll is purpose. It is destiny in life. And it says that there is a flying scroll. What does that mean? That means that this scroll is on the move. And it is on the move right now. He asked me, what do you see? I, I answered, I see a flying scroll. It's um, 30 feet long um, and 15 feet wide, roughly. He uses cubits. And he said to me, this is the curse, the what? The curse that is going out over the whole land. For according to what it says on one side, every thief will be banished. I just mentioned to you about a thief, somebody who stole. Because of what's going out, because of the word of the Lord that's on this, because of the purposes of God in this generation right now, right now, every thief will be banished. And according to what it says on the other, everyone who swears falsely, people who lie, people who are not telling the truth, people who are hiding, people who are functioning immorally, who swears falsely will be banished. The Lord Almighty declares, I will send it out and it will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by his name. Listen, these are people who function quote unquote prophetically they're using the Lord's name to swear falsely this is not good it is two parts the thieves those who are stealing those who are squatting taking over somebody else's property taking it, it it's where it's where greed and envy speak of you know in in the Ten Commandments it, it is a horrific 
thing that happens when people begin, become greedy. They want what somebody else has. Listen, you do not want what anybody else has. You want to walk in the disposition that God has called for you from the foundations of the earth. And if you know Jesus, he has a call on your life for what he's called you to do, not what he's called somebody else to do. Don't become anybody else. You be who you are. I've been told so many times, do you know you remind me of? Do you know you remind me of? Do you remember? And they, they name all these whatever. You know what? I am Danny Stain. That's who I am. Before the Lord, that's who I am. One day when I stand before him, I'm not going to stand with any of those other names. I'm not going to stand with any of the other anointings. The reality is, is that God has put an anointing on my life and I better be faithful to that anointing. And in fact, the reason I'm sharing this even now is because I feel like if I don't, I will become responsible. You know, Ezekiel says, if you know somebody who is in error and you do not warn them, I'm going to require their blood at your hand. Wow. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. I know I'm saved. I know I'm getting to heaven. But what's he going to say to me at the, at the judgment seat of Christ? He's going to say, man, you knew about this. You said nothing. I revealed this to you, but you did nothing. He finishes with this verse. Ready? He says, I'm going to send it out. It will enter the house of the thief and the house of anyone who swears falsely by my name. And it will remain. It will what? It will remain in that house. This is not just for you. This is for your children and your children's children. This is something, it will remain in that house and destroy it completely. In other words, all the impact you have had in people's lives is about to be gone. Both its timbers and its stones. That all the impact that you've had, some of you for decades in people's lives, by, by you falsely prophesying, by you just using things. I mean, it, it sickens me when people say, yeah, um, they, they actually were looking up who, who was in the conference and, oh my gosh. When I would go to conferences early, in the early days, I don't, I don't do this as much anymore because I didn't feel like I needed to. Maybe I do. But in the early days, when I would go to conferences, I would stay in, in a, a, a green room or a study until, uh, until worship had already begun. Because I didn't want to go in there and schmooze over everybody and look and see and wonder and, and, and try and read what's going on on them. And then I would come in after things had begun. I'd go sit on the front row and I would remain focused on worship. I would focus on worshiping Jesus. And then afterwards, I would give prophetic words. I still give prophetic words. It happens weekly in my house. Why? Because God is a God who speaks. My God is not silent. God did not lift his hand off of his church because some people abused it and misused it and manipulated it. Those who swear falsely by his name, those, those who are doing those things, you are in grave place. It, you need to repent. And I don't mean repent quietly with your wife or with another leader. I mean you need to repent publicly. This is serious. Secondly, those who want to acquire. You know, I, I remember when PTL went down in the 80s. It was 1987. I remember it very well. And I remember how there was another ministry that, that wanted to take it over and then another ministry wanted to take it over. It didn't do good for either of those ministries. Why? Why? God doesn't want you to take over anything. God wants you to do what he's called you to do. If I was in the same situation as what's happening in Anaheim, my God, I'd run. I would beg forgiveness. And I would give the keys to somebody else. You don't, you don't take a building, and I think it's $63 million, and just somehow this becomes your ministry now. And you can do whatever you want. Oh my gosh. There is something so shameful about that. What saddens me is that this is the one who is, who is married. And I believe they're one in this. Married. 
to one of the ones who's written some of the most incredible worship songs. I pray that you have not gotten used to this air that you're breathing because it's not the air of his kingdom. It's the error of the kingdom. My hope, my hope is that on all fronts, and for those of you who have been, who have been hurt, some of you invested thousands, maybe, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars into, into the ministry in Kansas City. It's hard for you. You're like, I believed in this. Well, some of the things that you believed in were absolutely correct. Just learn to discern. God will lead you. He will show you. But he will grow you. This is not a bad thing that this got exposed. It's a very good thing. Because God wants his church back. And in order for him to have his church back, the church has to go through what's called purification. It's where God cleanses us and heals us and delivers us from those things that have controlled us. Money can control us. All kinds of things can control us. You don't want that in your life. And so I'm going to pray right now. And if any of you who've been affected, impacted by any of that, I want you just to pray with me. I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask God for several things because you know what in on the flip side of this bitterness can rise so quickly when people have been hurt bitterness comes in your heart bitterness is probably the the most difficult thing to get rid of and some of us have become bitter for the people who were hurt and that's even harder because now you're picking up somebody else's offense and so that is one of the things i'm going to pray pray against, but I'm also going to just pray that those of you who, who know that God is on the throne, God will not allow the promises made to you to not be fulfilled. And I promise you those promises will, will squash any, any promises or any mm, sense that somebody got a one up on you. God will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. Holy Spirit, I ask right now, Lord, anybody who's watching this or watching the replay, I'm asking God in your name, in your name, that you release, you release, you release, you release freedom. Lord, freedom from prophetic stuff that has been wrong, but Lord, an embracing of, of who you are, Lord, because the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Lord, you are right. You are intertwined with the prophetic word. You are intertwined with it. We cannot reject prophecy without rejecting you. And so, Father, I ask, Father, people would, would, would absolutely once again embrace those things that you've spoken to them, that you've spoken through others to them. Father, things they've heard in your words that have been very prophetic. I'm asking, Lord, that you would absolutely release that, Lord, that your word would become alive inside of them again. And Father, they wouldn't reject everything. That, Father, that they would be discerning and clear and truthful and honest. And, Father, for those who have been, been, have come in this way, Father, who have used the prophetic, Lord, in a negative way and have used the control, manipulate, and, and cause their own name to be honored because of their great uh, prophetic ability that, Lord, in many cases is just not right. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you draw them to your repentance. Lord, it's your kindness that draws people to repentance. I'm asking, Lord, for release of kindness on their life right now and that they would repent, they would turn. They would turn back to you and that, Father, they repent and be cleansed. Father, for those who, who, who have, have it out to, to take over what others want and who believe that this is, this is something God has given to them and stolen it from those that God promised it to. Father, Father, please draw them to the place, Lord, again, of repentance. That your kindness may be, may, may be merciful to them again. Lord, I pray. I pray, Father, that, that, that right now that you, you move, Father. I'm asking, Lord, right now that, Lord, in that place, that, Lord, that, that what you've been saying will be true. Father, that, that it, it won't diminish down. Father, where, where it's, what, 100 people? Maybe less? 
in a place that at one time had 5,000 or more. Father, I'm asking right now that you absolutely cause there to be a transition and a shift and a change and that you do, you do what you want to do with the vineyard Anaheim. What you called it. What you spoke it into being. I'm asking God that those who are standing beside, Father, they will understand the absolute fear of the Lord in regards to this. That this is not something to stand behind. This is something to move out of the way. Because God, God doesn't, doesn't deal with Ahab's. The way we in our Ah, what was that word? Unsanctified mercy would. That there are those whom God wants to correct. And we better not stand in the way of what God wants to correct. I ask God for your mercy. And ask God that you bring about a quick, sudden resolution and change. That the keys would once again change hands and be in the hands that you destined and promised it to. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that was a rather specific thing. People say, man, you're blunt. This is probably one of the bluntest ones I've ever shared. I really want to ask that you please share this. And, um, and my hope is that God will use it to bring about correction where there has to be correction. There, there, there are victims. There are people who are victims legitimately on both fronts. God doesn't like it when people create victims. He just doesn't like it. I pray the fear of the Lord would come on the lives of those who have created the victims and that great repentance would sweep the body. Bless you. You have a good day.